So this Korean industry was sworn in on December 6, 2021 as the Deputy Administrator for Defense Nuclear Non-Proliferation at the National Nuclear Security Administration, where she leads NNSA's efforts to prevent state and non-state actors from developing nuclear weapons or acquiring weapons usable nuclear or radiological materials, equipment, technology, and expertise. Prior to assuming her current role, she was a Vice President of International Fuel Science and Strategies at the Nuclear Threat Initiative, NTI, in Washington, D.C., where she focused on international nuclear fuel cycle and non-proliferation policy, global nuclear security, arms control, non-proliferation, monitoring and verification. From February 2015 through November 2017, Ms. Hindustin was Senior Coordinator for Nuclear Security and Non-Proliferation Policy Affairs at Defense Nuclear Non-Proliferation Office of the NMSA, where she led DOE's preparations for the 2016 Nuclear Security Summit and worked on many other projects related to nuclear security and illicit traffic, Iran's nuclear program, and international monitoring and verification. Um, she's also the past president and fellow of the Institute of Nuclear Materials Management, she served on the board of directors, for the World Institute for Nuclear Security. She's also served in advisory capacity for multiple national laboratories and has published widely on nuclear non-proliferation, verification, and monitoring, and nuclear security. So with that, um, can we play the video? Hello to everyone joining us for this important event. Efforts to prevent the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction require cooperation across the international community, governments, and industry. So it is reassuring that so many countries and companies are represented at this seminar. Your participation demonstrates a clear mutual understanding that our citizens are more secure when we partner together and share best practices. On behalf of the U.S. Department of Energy, National Nuclear Security Administration, I'm pleased to congratulate Singapore and our event partner Japan on the 10th anniversary of the Joint Industry Outreach Seminar. This anniversary is a testament to the hard work and dedication of numerous officials within Singapore, Japan, and the U.S. government, and we greatly appreciate our joint efforts on a wide range of nonproliferation issues. This collaboration provides a concrete example of how cooperation between international partners can lead to a world that is safer from the threats posed by weapons of mass destruction. My remarks today will address the benefits proliferation risks and actions we can take to address challenges posed by emerging technologies. U.S. President Joe Biden, during remarks before the 76th session of the United Nations General Assembly, stated that emerging technologies are a revolution that pose both promise and peril. Additive manufacturing, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, among other technologies identified by the White House in its February 2022 list of critical and emerging technologies, will shape every aspect of our lives and our respective national security and economic interests. We must collectively advance our shared objectives and establish new rules and practices that will allow us to seize the opportunities presented by technological advancement while protecting them from exploitation by countries seeking to build WMDs. COVID-19 and other recent events show that many of the threats we face respect neither borders nor walls, and as a result, the United States must deepen our partnerships with Singapore, Japan, and other ASEAN member states. If we are slow to act collectively, emerging technologies can lower proliferation barriers or enable new proliferation pathways for those that wish to exploit these technologies for malicious purposes. For example, additive manufacturing has amazing commercial benefits, but could also become capable of manufacturing proliferation-sensitive items, challenging the multilateral export control regimes to update their guidelines or take new approaches to manage sensitive trade before would-be proliferators take advantage of this new manufacturing methods and any gaps that we have in our systems. My agency, the U.S. Department of Energy's National Nuclear Security Administration, or NNSA, works to anticipate both the risks and opportunities presented by a range of emerging technologies and prepare solutions in response to those challenges. NNSA is investing in several emerging technology areas and program innovations to bolster its nuclear risk reduction mission. At the same time, the diffuse nature and wide availability of these technologies 
also present U.S. national security challenges. NNSA is working with the U.S. interagency partners to look at how to strengthen regulatory frameworks designed to prevent the diversion of WMD-related goods and technology to minimize proliferation risks posed by these technologies. As an example of our efforts to address these threats and the way new technologies can be a boon, NNSA is leading the U.S. effort to invest in next-generation artificial intelligence to support early detection of nuclear threats, including covert nuclear material production and movement, weapons development activities, and nuclear detonations. We explore AI-based methods to identify institutions with relevant expertise and their associated facilities, analyze open-source technical publications, detect illicit procurements by foreign companies, track the progress of weapons-related research, and fuse sensor data to improve proliferation assessments. The vast and diverse talent across the U.S. national laboratories has always been the foundation of our work with partners across a broad array of non-proliferation missions. Identifying emerging technology opportunities and challenges will require inventive and new ideas, requiring us to continue diversifying our workforce to obtain new perspectives and approaches. It is also essential that we invest in our future workforce by developing expertise in cutting-edge science and technology. With this goal in mind, I'm also pleased to share a new program of work on Women in Strategic Trade, or WIST. This effort will directly engage women in strategic trade positions, including licensing, enforcement, and other export and trade-related fields. The inaugural WIST event is being organized in partnership between NNSA and the Department of State and will take place on Wednesday, following the conclusion of the Singapore Joint Industry Outreach Seminar. The WIST event will include a remote hybrid component, allowing for participants to join from around the world. Following the kickoff seminar, we expect WIST to grow globally, starting with a series of webinars and additional in-person events to highlight the prominent and essential roles and contributions of women in strategic trade, explore avenues for professional development, and showcase their expertise to help recruit, retain, and train more women in the field. In conclusion, strategic trade controls for emerging technology will play an increasingly critical role in our shared nonproliferation and security efforts. These controls allow the companies here today to conduct the international trade so instrumental to everyone's economic growth and prosperity, while effectively managing the flow of proliferation-sensitive goods and technology critical to our collective security. The organizers and participants at this conference deserve praise and recognition for the dedication they have shown over the past decade to encourage government and industry to work collaboratively to control the trade of strategic items, keeping them out of the hands of actors who would do us harm. Today, Singapore is an example for other countries in Southeast Asia and around the world to follow with its strong strategic trade control system and commitment to nonproliferation. Again, I'm so sorry I couldn't be there with you today, but I look forward to continuing our partnerships and to our future joint achievements. Thank you for the opportunity to speak remotely and congratulations on 10 years of industry outreach for strategic trade management. Thank you. Um, many of the things that, that we are doing do have high level support, including the new initiative uh, that some of us are involved in, Women in Strategic Trade. Um, with this, um, I'm, we will now transition to another discussion on emerging tech. I invite uh, my friend and colleague, Robert Shaw, to come up on stage. And while he's there, I, coming up, I will tell you a little bit more about him. He is the Program Director for Export Control and Non-Proliferation Program at James Martin Center for Non-Proliferation Studies at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. Um, Mr. Shaw coordinates the center's export control related research and educational activities. He's also an adjunct prof professor for the Mid Middlebury Institute, co teaching a graduate course on strategic trade controls and non proliferation. Uh, he has applied his experience in the private sector to research and writing articles examining the role of industry in global non proliferation and export control efforts, the challenge of illicit WMD procurement networks, and the reform of US export control system. He has been invited to share an industry practitioner's view at multiple non-proliferation forums, including events organized by the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe 
and the U.S. Department's, uh, Department of State's Office of uh, Export Control Cooperation. So with that, um, I'm going to invite Robert to uh, make a presentation. Would you like to continue? Yes. And then we have Thank you. Hello again, everyone. And uh, um, without a doubt, this is one of the, the uh, toughest uh, slots in the speaking schedule, being right after lunch. But um, but I'm hopeful since we're, we're going to be looking at um, some of the most uh, cutting edge areas of technology and by extension strategic trade management that we have some some interesting uh, material. Uh, to, to share with you here, and this is really just just the beginning. Is we um, uh, following following this session, there will be a, a panel on emerging technology that will um, uh, provide a deeper dive, we would say, into the topics. Uh, and uh, I anticipate, as we hear from regulators tomorrow, uh, there'll be uh, even further, um, uh, uh, you know further exploration of this topic at a, at a, at a very current, active, and front lines level. Uh, so it's sort of in that spirit that the, um, uh, what we'll be providing here is an, is an overview of emerging technologies, trends, and challenges. And um, looking at the, the technologies to some extent as a group, and what are the, what are the common sort of characteristics, what are the uh, challenges uh, associated, though, uh, uh, with um, the sharing of the technologies, the cross-border sharing and trade of the technologies and so forth, as well as some of the opportunities also. So there are a few things in the presentation that might be described as scary, but there's also some, some very much uh, promise in this area uh, in terms of the application of these technologies in the spirit of economic development and human welfare. And so, um, so this is very much a scene-setting presentation to really set the stage for some of the uh, discussions um, that uh, the uh, seminar will, will, will move into uh, with the panel and then onward into uh, tomorrow. So what do we mean by emerging technologies? And um, so in the same way, the earlier discussion involving ITT controls, I'll go, go ahead and provide sort of a, a framework uh, definition for us to, to, to sort of work with. And then I have some representative technologies that are sort of captured here uh, on the visual. But uh, emerging technologies you know, uh, represent um, uh, uh, technologies that are uh, certainly at the cutting edge, but also primarily dual use, and even arguably uh, emerging from the civilian, emer emerging from the academic, emerging from the commercial sectors, rather than having their origin necessarily in the military sector. And so almost from their inception, uh, these are dual use in, in, in nature and uh, also reflecting a wide variety of actors. It's not something that's, that's sort of emerging, let's say, from a government and defense-oriented R&D effort and then later spins off to a commercial dual-use technology. This is something, these are technologies that are already sort of in that commercial uh, academic space, widely accessible, in some cases widely distributed. We'll go into some of these characteristics in a bit further detail, but I think a key term here is that they're, they're new, experimental, largely dual use, and, and, and already um, widely distributed across, across actors. I have here a representative list which sort of echoes, we, we heard part of this list in the, in the opening video by, um, by Ms. Henderson, uh, and um, this is not exhaustive, uh, certainly not in the realm of emerging technologies. In fact, as we're speaking here, there are probably more being added in, added to this list, but this is just kind of a representative list. It includes additive manufacturing, commonly known as 3D printing, quantum computing, um, as well as other forms of advanced computing. In the biotech arena, uh, the, the area of precision medicine and how that's informed by gene editing tools such as CRISPR. Um, also, uh, the broad arena of unmanned aerial vehicles and we're uh, technologies related to this area as that space has moved beyond the military sector 
and into a wide range of commercial and scientific uses, and then also aerospace-related hypersonic technologies. You'll no notice, though, that I've highlighted in bold uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Certainly, this, can, this is a distinct area of emerging technology, but it also augments uh, many, if not most, of the emerging technologies that are commonly described, that are commonly listed when we talk about strategic trade management and those emerging technologies that are capturing the attention uh, in terms of international security. Uh, because it's, it's this technology that can in many, in many ways augment uh, the uh, and accelerate uh, and add value to the other emerging technologies. And I think we also, again, heard that in the opening video about how AI is being applied to benefit certain very specific areas of, of non-proliferation programs uh, in a good sense, highlighting, again, that there's a dual dimension here. There are risks, but there are also opportunities. Characteristics of emerging technologies. I've touched upon this a bit, so, um, but here we've sort of concisely captured it in a set of sort of four bullet points. Still very much new, emerging, and maybe the best term here would be sort of in an experimental and developmental phase. Um, now, some, some of the technologies were already seen being kind of deployed into, into sort of commercial domains, particularly in the uh, civilian space area. Uh, the use of 3D printing, and I will uh, be using 3D printing uh, in this presentation as kind of an example uh, to illustrate uh, some of these characteristics. And um, but with only a few exceptions, uh, generally not on strategic trade control lists. What that means is uh, almost immediately these technologies uh, the primary mode of strategic trade management, strategic trade control, is focused on end use and end user and intermediary uh, party controls. Uh, what we what we refer to as the sort of suite of catch-all controls. From the very beginning, this is kind of primarily where uh, where emerging technologies fall on the strategic trade management spectrum. Which means this is difficult for both regulators as well as industry. Absolutely. Um, the focus is maybe less on the technology itself and looking more holistically at who's involved in a particular cross-border transaction. And then the technology itself, as I touched upon this morning, is largely in digital, digital and intangible formats. Uh, this is true with 3D printing and 3D printing design files. If we look at the biotech arena, much of that is in the realm of, of intangible knowledge and then using data in intangible format, genetic data, uh, with that knowledge uh, uh, you know, to produce specific uh, outcomes. Um, and so, uh, so this accentuates uh, the intangible dimension as well, which adds some, some challenges also. Additionally, there is extensive cross-sector collaboration in R&D. This is an area uh, that involves um, R&D uh, in uh, industry, but also research in universities and research within government institutions. And in emerging technologies, collaboration is common. Uh, a great example, again, using 3D printing as kind of a, a, a case example, is Universities in Germany, as well as the German government and German industry, have been working together to um, really advance the development and actual application of 3D printing. This share, this sort of distributes the risk of investment. Uh, we do have some public funds moving in, but we also have industry and commercial funds moving in, to where the cost of that R&D is somewhat distributed. The the upfront risk is somewhat reduced from a business standpoint. Uh, and um, uh, and so you have a wider range of actors that are involved in the R and D process, and um, and so that translates into something quite interesting when we think about strategic trade management and especially inside industry compliance. Is let's say if you're a uh, you're a company, a manufacturer, and you um, you've received an order from a university consortium. 
uh, for some uh, production equipment or measurement equipment, maybe more accurately. And the, on the surface, this, this would appear to be a very low risk transaction. It's for university consortiums, for basic research. It seems you know, rather, rather harmless. But in the area of emerging technologies, it's important to, to kind of consider, wait a minute, this is a consortium, this is a university, there may be other collaborators in the research project. So what is the background of the consortium? Who's funding it? Who's involved? Where are the, are the results of the research restricted, proprietary in any way? Is there a military dimension to the work? All of these are key questions that really should be asked uh, if, uh, in recognizing that the commercial and industrial sector does frequently engage in transactions with the university sector and vice versa. So something to think about uh, from the standpoint of due diligence and some of, um, some of the specific uh, transactions that may be closer to the R&D area. And then also this, this area is characterized by a vibrant entrepreneurial startup culture, as you might imagine. These are emerging technologies. They attract um, uh, risk takers uh, in a good sense, uh, those who wish to become disruptors of markets and to create new markets. Um, but uh, it also, uh, uh, which is a good thing, uh, you have uh, fresh ideas that can emerge from that, but at the same time, it introduces challenges. And those challenges I've, I've enumerated, um, again, not exhaustive, but I've, I've highlighted here. Um, the collaborations, the, the fact that this is an area that involves industry, university, government sectors, you have these entrepreneurial communities that are involved, um, so you have new and varied actors, some of whom genuinely may not be aware of the security risks and the dual use potential of these technologies. Um, uh, they, they have every intention of promoting the more positive, the, the civilian commercial side of them, but um, could be targets for exploitation, could, could find themselves immersed in this sort of illicit technology acquisition. These collaborations among these actors are also extensive. And as I mentioned, it may complicate due diligence uh, checks. Uh, it's, it's not just a transaction with the university. You have to think about who is involved in that university project and, and um, the, the potential sectors that may be represented. And speaking neutrally here, speaking just as a matter of fact, military programs and end users from a variety of governments are actively engaged in the development and adoption of emerging technologies. This makes sense because of their potential value for defense programs. And so given that these technologies are already sort of out there, already in the commercial and academic space, it's not surprising that military programs, military end users are going to look at universities as potential collaborators. So this is something to, 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 to be mindful of. Uh, and, um, not all of these collaborations are nefarious. Uh, in fact, the majority are not. But it is something that's it's important to be mindful of, particularly in, in the commercial and compliance area. And aerospace itself is a key sector that's driving a lot of this also. This is where we're really seeing the emerging technologies being applied actively, uh, especially the, the sort of space launch, um, uh, satellite launch vehicle uh, industry. Uh, and this leads us to sort of a spotlight. First, kind of looking at um, some of the uh, some of the clearly dual use uh, 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 outcomes or products that that uh, can be produced through 3D printing. But this is part one of a uh, of a suite of, of, of slides. And so we'll start out with with what was you know arguably the only the only item on here is associated with an export control violation. Uh, and that is uh, the, the, to the upper left, this is the plastic handgun. This was actually on, on one of the polling questions earlier. Uh, this was developed actually by a nonprofit um, uh, organization in the US, or an advocacy organization. Uh, um, but they designed a uh, handgun uh, designed to be uh, 3D printed using the simplest, most common, the cheapest 3D printer and the cheapest plastic materials. And they succeeded. They created a design that could work with these printers 
work with the basic plastics and create a gun that actually fired a real bullet. And they demonstrated this. Uh, and this immediately got the attention of the security policy community and put 3D printing arguably on the map. Uh, this is a somewhat outlier case. The other examples here are fully authorized projects. Uh, so, but uh, we see also the use of 3D printing there. So we see uh, a, a um, sort of a short range projectile, 3D printed entirely using plastic, uh, a jet powered drone on the upper right uh, uh, image, and then a full, that's been maybe 80% 3D printed, and then a fully 3D printed drone produced by uh, Israeli Aerospace Industries in the center picture. And then to the right are customized 3D printers uh, that have been developed by a startup Rel Relativity with the aim of ultimately 3D printing a space launch vehicle that can launch a satellite into low Earth orbit. What that means is a space launch vehicle uh, is, can also, in theory, be adapted to be a long-range missile. And uh, either way, you're looking at something on Category 1 of the Missile Technology Control Regime, also captured by the EU dual use list. Again, though, these projects, with the exception of the, of the gun, these are all authorized projects, uh, but it illustrates the attractiveness of 3D printing in the aerospace, space, uh, and areas that are very sort of uh, areas that are highly controlled from a strategic trade management standpoint. Now, I do want to touch upon, though, kind of the, the another sort of dimension of 3D printing and some of the opportunities uh, that regulators are mindful of, that policymakers are mindful of. And this is the use of 3D printing to really advance human welfare. Uh, I think it's a wonderful example that we have uh, featured in the photo to the left. Um, these are valves used in ventilators, uh, medical ventilators. And there was a, um, uh, basically a startup in Italy that represented a consortium of 3D printing sort of enthusiasts, hobbies. Uh, kind of organized an effort at the very beginning of the COVID pandemic, when Italy was one of the first countries that really experienced a crisis in terms of hospital capacity. Their hospitals were overflowing with COVID patients. Ventilators were at max usage and were actually beginning to fail, with valves being a common component that would fail. And so this startup led, a, led kind of a, a consortium of 3D printing enthusiasts uh, and printed replacement valves, recognizing that the global supply chain had already been disrupted by COVID. And so they were able to keep certain ventilators running, moving with these replacement valves despite the supply chain challenges. I think this really illustrates the dual use nature of the products, is that there's a great potential here as well uh, for well-being. Um, the photo to the right also underscores this, is that this is a, a um, one of the maker fair events, which promotes uh, um, sort of hobbyists and, and startups. And uh, featured here is a startup in, in, in Cairo, Egypt, um, that's using 3D printing for medical mobility devices and to easily produce and, and cheaply produce medical prosthetics. Um, so again, it's something that all of us need to keep in mind. And, and it's true, the, the policy side, the regulation side, is, is already doing this. They've been um, work, strategic trade control, strategic trade management in this area has been moving um, uh, rather cautiously. And um, here I just will close uh, with a coverage of, uh, of sort of risk mitigation work in this area, being mindful of that dual use dimension. So regulators are identifying and adding select emerging technologies to the control list. This is done, uh, has been done sort of largely in a multilateral uh, basis um, through the lens of the uh, Bosnar arrangement and uh, um, and uh, the Department of Commerce PIS has been also active in this area and we are seeing select emerging technologies being added to control this but we're seeing that these are very precisely defined uh, to where it's it's a limited set of hardware and software that, that um, is added to the control list and requires a license and this is because um, on the policy side, there's care taken in terms of not wanting to over-regulate something while it's still in a fresh state of development. But it's, there's still a responsibility for risk management related to catch-all control. 
calls. And this is where uh, the industry side really comes into play. And sort of being mindful of if you're doing, if you're engaged in trade in these technologies, to be really mindful of who you're trading with, who your business partners are. Um, there are, uh, there have been some documented enforcement actions related uh, to um, emerging technologies. I mentioned the the, um, uh, the handgun earlier, but just two months ago there was an enforcement action in the U.S. that did involve the export of 3D printing design files for aerospace and defense applications. Uh, there are indications that this ex that, that the export may not have been properly authorized, and so uh, this was a result. Um, this resulted in an investigation and in action, uh, and uh, we may hear more about this. Um, as, as the program continues. So there is work being done in the risk mitigation area, but recognizing that much of the technologies are in this sort of catch-all emphasizing end use and end user control emphasizing area. A great resource for industry are uh, NGOs uh, themselves, non-proliferation, international security focused NGOs, consultancies working in the space that are looking at specific emerging technologies and, um, and publishing guidance that can support due diligence. I'll close with just a brief highlight. Uh, uh, just, uh, just last week, actually, um, our Center for Nonproliferation Studies published a sectoral guide um, uh, led out of our Washington, D.C. office and uh, that, uh, that provides sort of due diligence supportive guidance related to uh, 10 uh, key technologies. And so we encourage you to take a look uh, that can be found at tradecompliance.io. Uh, uh, that is a sort of web domain for, for, for that guidance, uh, which may be, again, quite useful in the due diligence space. Other NGOs are doing the same thing. So this is a great resource if um, you're wanting to keep up with these technologies and, and, and really support your end use and end user due diligence checks. So with that, I know I've gone a bit over time, um, but uh, I'll, I'll bring the presentation segment to a close. about technology controls, but sometimes technology is controlling us, so <laughs> I'm trying to help that, do that. So, uh, Robert, my first uh, question to you is, uh, you have talked, uh, you know, in fact, previous panel too, we, we heard a lot more about how emerging technology is, specifically 3D printing is one of those issues that uh, we need to be thinking about. Um, there are three parts to 3D uh, printing technology. It's, uh, of course, um, you know, the printers themselves, there's the materials, and then of course there are the CAD files, the software files that go with it. Um, BIS is of course, as you, as your last slide showed, is trying to regulate some of those, you know, the files that are. Uh, in terms of materials to make things, um, one, one thing that we do notice that in, in cases of dual use technologies, um, the reason why they make it to the control list usually is because they have some specific um, characteristic. Right? It could be resistance. It could be that you know it is uh, uh, corrosion proof, something which has to do with the materials, not just with the machining part, which three D printers can do. So, what what is uh, happening in terms of a discussion about those things, about the parts that go into them? Uh, th thank you, Seema. That's a, it's a great question, and that's just the way that you framed that as, as well, is that when we look at 3D printing as, a, as an emerging technology, you actually need to kind of break it, um, when we're thinking of it in terms of strategic trade management, it's important to kind of break it into you know, what constitutes, to some extent, a 3D printing transaction, so to speak. You have the design file, which is instructing the computer that in turn sort of instructs the printer to print what you want. But um, 
uh, and you have the printer itself, but then you have the materials. And, and this has been identified as by, um, in particular, the, the nuclear suppliers group, um, but it's also captured the attention of, of the missile technology control regime and so forth. And again, this is based on, you know, these were more of the open source public domain uh, arena, uh, not being privy to, 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 to their discussions, but uh, this is an area of interest. Um, what we have seen is, just as there's been sort of a, a revolution, let's say, in 3D printing capabilities, there's been a revolution, or maybe partially driving that, in the material, the range of materials that can be used. So, I mean, the handgun, basic plas plastics, but at the more industrial level, what we're seeing with the, with the drones and so forth, you can, titanium, Inconel, uh, stainless steel, mirage and steel, um, all of these are potential materials that can be used in metal powder form uh, for a 3D printer. And it's the powders in particular that, that, are, that the regimes have been, have been looking at quite closely. I'm not privy to some of the details of, 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 of that, but that is sort of seen as, as an area where risk mitigation may be applied, kind of recognizing that um, you know, there may be only a limited uh, uh, set of suppliers uh, uh, of a particular uh, material. Just a quick note uh, to add on, there's also custom-made materials just for 3D printers that are showing up as well, kind of reflecting the entrepreneurial nature of the space. This is likely to also attract some attention, also from, um, in terms of, you know, potentially the regime's taking a look at this and, and, and considering some control strategies. Another question I have is, in terms of uh, part of regulators thinking, if we are thinking about these, uh, you know, somewhat cutting edge materials or, um, you know, technology software, um, what can governments do to train the people who are actually doing the licensing? Where do they get um, that, that you know, core of knowledge or e even awareness to say this may be controlled and requires technical expertise to assess that? Uh, excellent, uh, excellent question as, as well, and I think this is, this is kind of an interesting area that takes us to the concept of, of technical reach back. Actually, is is from the regulate from, from the regulatory side, having someone, um, particularly with the scientific, technical, or engineering knowledge that you can sort of connect with and consult with in, in, uh, to to assess. With the risk of, 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 it, of, of these technologies would be extremely valuable. And this is what we are seeing regulators doing is, is turning to national labs, turning to universities, actually. You know, uh, this is where a lot of the emerging technologies are occurring. So I think it's important for regulators uh, to build relationships, both, of course, within the government, but also with universities, uh, the academic sphere, uh, uh, that, that can support, whether it's formal or informal technical reach back on, on that, those types of questions. So yes, it was an interesting, uh, I'm told we are out of time, so we will move on uh, to the next session, which again, incidentally, is about emerging technology. So we have a lot of emerging technologies emerging from all corners of this. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. So as we transition into the next panel, um, we do have a question on that. Right? It is a basic question. We want to yeah, right? skip that. We'll keep the things moving along. Um, so the moderator for this panel is uh, my colleague and friend, Dr. Uh, Mr. Daniel Johnson. He is technical advisor for the U.S. National Nuc Nuclear Security Administration, NSA, NNSA, International Non-Proliferation Export Control Program. He's on detail to NNSA from Lawrence Livermore National Lab, which he joined in December 2020 after eight years at the World Institute for Nuclear Security, uh, WINS, 
At WINS, he was senior advisor and head of the WINS Academy, responsible for establishing the world's first international certification program for nuclear security management. He has previously worked at Brookhaven National Lab, Department of Energy's China Office, and the Center for Non-Operation Studies. He has a master's degree in international policy studies and a certificate in non-proliferation studies from the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Montreal. With that, I hand over all of the rest to the speakers. Thank you, Seema, for that introduction. Uh, thanks, Robert, wherever you are, for setting the scene. Thank you so much, Robert. Uh, it's going to help us get this uh, final panel started. Uh, so welcome to the final session. I hope you're still all with us and energized. We've got some excellent speakers here, so I think it should be fun. Uh, we also only have three speakers, so hopefully we'll have a little bit more time uh, for questions and answers, so please put in your questions into Menti, uh, or use the microphones. I don't think anybody's actually used a microphone today, uh, so we'll see if anybody becomes especially brave. Uh, so the topic for this panel uh, continues the theme from this afternoon, uh, so we're going to talk some more about emerging technology. Uh, as uh, the NNSA Deputy Administrator, Corey Enderstein, uh, said in her recorded remarks, uh, emerging technologies are a revolution that pose both promise but also peril. Um, and so Robert kind of outlined what the various uh, technologies are, uh, additive manufacturing, artificial intelligence, quantum computing. Uh, and there, these technologies are really going to shape every aspect of our lives and it's also going to impact our respective uh, national security concerns and economic interests. These new technologies are also putting pressure on an export control regime that in some cases may be ill-equipped to define or practically control these technologies. Uh, also, when, when considering controls, policymakers will need to balance questions of technological development and economic competitiveness with national security priorities. So we have uncertainties and ambiguities around this. From, so from an export control perspective, uh, it makes emerging technology very challenging to govern. But fortunately, uh, we have a great group of expert panelists here to help us discuss this challenging topic. Uh, we have Mr. Kit Conklin. He's the Vice President of CARON. Uh, we also have Dr. Uh, Ji Young Yu. She's an Associate Research Fellow uh, at the Science and Technology Policy Institute in the Republic of Korea. Uh, and then we also have Ms. Anita Zinzuvadia. Uh, she's a Licensing Officer and Electrical Engineer at the Bureau of Industry and Security at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, some of the points that this panel will discuss include the impact of emerging technologies, on the fundamental way that entire industries function, uh, different regulatory uh, schemes and export licensing approaches for these technologies, uh, the difficulties in designing controls for emerging tech, and gaps in export control regimes and regulations, uh, military civil fusion risks, I think that's been mentioned a couple of times today, and also the role of industry uh, support in collaborating with government to help mitigate the risks. Uh, so please consider questions related to these points while our speakers talk. Uh, thanks for your participation in this panel. We're going to start uh, with our first speaker, and again, I think we'll have a little bit more time for Q&A today because we have three speakers. Uh, but our first speaker is uh, Kit Conklin. Uh, so Kit is a, a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Geotech Center and the Vice President of Global Client Engagement with the research and data analytics firm Caron. Prior to Caron, Kit served in various national security positions with the U.S. government where he specialized in emerging technologies and export controls. Please, Kit. Good afternoon, everyone. The purpose of today's discussion really is to provide a little bit more granular detail about the risks from a military civil fusion perspective with emerging technologies. Uh, fellow panelists have done a great job outlining a bit more about what these technologies are and why they are relevant. Um, but today, what I will specialize in is walking you through a few examples of how the US government has utilized export controls uh, as well as sanctions to target 
uh, some of these networks around the world that are procuring this type of, of emerging and disruptive technology. Um, so with that, we all appreciate and recognize that AI and quantum and additive manufacturing represent emerging security risks. I think that's become very evident over the course of the last few hours. Um, but one thing that I think um, regulators and industry should appreciate and recognize is that export controls, when it comes to emerging technologies, are the last resort from a policy perspective. Uh, by the time that export controls are placed on a technology, it's because they've advanced to the point where uh, they need to be controlled. And while that may sound easy to understand, it creates challenges for academia and for industry that are the front lines of innovation. So those universities around the world that have research partnerships with high-risk jurisdictions, it's certainly not illegal from an export control perspective to do that, but it nevertheless represents risk from an illicit technology transfer perspective. And so that's really the theme that we'll address uh, today as we move through this discussion. Um, and the other thing that I would just uh, really like to highlight for those in government that are in the audience today is that sometimes we forget that emerging technology actually takes a really long time to do. Um, it takes a long time from someone that has an idea to go and conduct the basic and foundational research necessary to advance that technology to the point where it's a dual-use technology or representative of a critical or national security risk. And so from a regulatory perspective, uh, it's always important to footstomp that government will never be able to out-regulate innovation. Uh, government and regulators will never be able to add all technologies to an export control restricted uh, list. They will never be able to add all uh, foreign military end users to some sort of list. So government in a lot of ways is playing catch up with respect to emerging technologies. Um, but that's not to say that there's not new ways that governments and industry and academia can work together to eliminate some of the risks uh, associated with emerging technology. And with that is, is kind of the background, what we're going to do now is take a look at a case study. And we're going to look at artificial intelligence in the context of Russia. Um, as we all know and appreciate, and as has been discussed uh, by uh, all of our government colleagues here today, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has created new opportunities for multilateral collaboration on sanctions and export controls. Um, perhaps at no point in the last few decades have international uh, disparate com uh, uh, countries from around the world come together from a policy perspective to really utilize export controls in a multilateral fashion the way that uh, has historically you know, not, not really taken place. But what I'll flag today, though, is artificial intelligence and the way that artificial intelligence has kind of gone under the radar of export controls um, the last few years. And so this really starts with Vladimir Putin, as most stories in Russia do. So in 2017, uh, President Putin described artificial intelligence as the future of the Russian economy and as the future of the Russian military. And when Vladimir Putin made that announcement, he also signified and signaled to the Russian defense industrial base and Russian academia um, that artificial intelligence was a priority with respect to uh, new technology requirements in the country. That meant uh, the Russian government authorized new funding, they created new science and technology centers, uh, they empowered universities and companies and startups with investments from the government to uh, develop new and emerging and critical AI technologies. And this took place five years ago. But as we see through this timeline, um, eventually the dual use na uh, nature of AI started to take place. And it was slow, the way that science happens. So when President Putin announced this major initiative for AI in 2017, a year later, uh, the Russian military started announcing new investments as well in artificial intelligence, with the uh, explicit objective being to develop AI-enabled weapons. And so 2020 comes along, and all of a sudden, uh, in the arms control world, there was a lot of discussion and uproar when uh, the Russian government announced uh, effectively an AI-enabled uh, nuclear torpedo uh, that has no crew and severely uh, 
places stressors on deterrence around the world. And so as this uh, technology was developed in Russia, we ultimately get to March 2022, when Russia invades Ukraine, and these emerging technologies that have been developed over the last five years suddenly begin to play a very outsized role in the military uh, invasion itself. So we have multiple reports um, from a variety of NGOs around the world that have outlined how uh, Russia has utilized AI-enabled missiles and drones and UAVs to target um, military uh, systems in Ukraine and uh, possibly even civilians as well. So this is the full cycle. This is, a, this is how uh, one country can start funding innovation. They can prioritize emerging technologies, and then within a matter of a few years, that technology is being fielded uh, not just for dual-use applications, but strictly for military applications. And so, what does that mean for those of you in this room? It means that there's a continuation by the U.S. government and other governments to utilize export control authorities and to utilize sanctions authorities to target these networks that are procuring uh, dual-use technologies like AI and like quantum from around the world. So here's an example of, of what this looks like. Uh, we're going to take this uh, proliferation network and, and kind of break it apart and see how the U.S. government in particular has utilized various authorities uh, to target these emerging technologies uh, from a national security perspective. So in the center, we have the Russian Quantum Center. This is a company and a research institute in Russia that is on the BIS entity list. Uh, the Russian Quantum Center, not surprisingly, specializes in quantum. And it was placed earlier this year on uh, the BIS entity list and is now subject to export control restrictions. And it's not just, I should add, export control restrictions for U.S. companies, but now that uh, the Department of Commerce has the foreign direct product role in place for uh, Russia, there are risks for any company around the world exporting goods that contain uh, U.S. products and U.S. Uh, control technologies in it to uh, individuals and organizations like the Russian Quantum Center. But so why does this really matter? It's because when you start peeling back the onion and you start utilizing open source intelligence and you start conducting enhanced due diligence on these types of networks, you begin to understand that just because the U.S. government or an NGO has publicly identified one company as being representative of risk, there's traditionally a broader network. Proliferation happens with a lot of different companies, a lot of different individuals, and a lot of different supply chains. So as you look upstream from the Russian Quantum Center, those in industry should take note that these companies are not on any sort of list, but they nevertheless, uh, nevertheless represent risk if you are exporting goods or products into Russia. Uh, in this case, the Russian Quantum Center is owned by a company, Grupa OOO. So as we continue to build out this network, you see how the U.S. government has begun to utilize different authorities to target this particular emerging technology in Russia. So Russian Quantum Center, if we follow the ownership chain up, you eventually get to these organizations in red. Organizations in red are sanctioned parties. And for those in the audience that may not spend a lot of time thinking about sanctions, uh, export control restrictions and sanctions are uh, slightly different in the United States. Um, there's a knowledge requirement for some parts of export controls, whereas if you do business with a sanctioned party or with an entity that's majority owned by a sanctioned party, uh, subject to sanctions in the United States, you could find yourself uh, in legal, uh, legal jeopardy. And so we highlight this as representative of when you crack open and you look at military civil fusion, and you look at how the U.S. government in particular has utilized various authorities, in this case both sanctions and export controls to target this network, you begin to quickly realize that um, there's more at play here than just one party, one company that's operating on behalf of the Russian government. Um, and then, in addition to this, uh, it gets even weirder. So as we build out this network, we learn that Really the crux, the most important thing when it comes to innovation is that academia plays an extremely important role. Emerging science, emerging and foundational technologies are developed 
with companies. They're developed with universities. Um, the governments traditionally aren't at the forefront of innovation for most of these technologies. And so for those uh, regulators and government uh, participants and companies that are working with univer uh, universities in your home country, it's important to understand who's on the other end of that research partnership that you're establishing. If you're providing money from a university to a foreign company or to a foreign organization, who's actually operating behind the scenes? When it comes to emerging and critical technologies, uh, frequently it's difficult to ascertain, but if you conduct that open source research, if you utilize resources that Robert Shaw and others at the Center for, uh, Center for Nonproliferation Studies and other NGOs around the world uh, publish, this information is out there. And this is an example whereby you have um, you know, universities in the United States as well as prestigious universities in the United Kingdom having research partnerships with companies that are on the BIS entity list. And you know what? It may not actually be an export control risk, but nevertheless, there's a research integrity risk here. And as um, new regulations in the United States and other places come into place, uh, this is another way that authorities are targeting emerging technologies um, and trying to control this technology in a more uh, critical way. And so with that, um, you know, the, the case studies here really revolve around how um, regulators should think about export controls, how they should think about sanctions, research integrity, research security, and increasingly foreign direct uh, uh, product rules and foreign investment screening coming into uh, your countries. So again, emerging technology is a confluence of all of these various regulatory authorities. So as you're developing these capabilities, if you're a regulator, it's important to think about holistically where are the gaps, how can we fill those gaps, and if you're a company and you're considering doing business or forming a partnership with some of these entities, that enhanced due diligence will um, help save you possible headache, especially from, from government agencies here in the room, possibly later on. And with that, let me uh, say thank you for your time and looking forward to um, the discussion here this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Kip. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, it's really nice to see the specific case examples to provide a little context for what we're talking about. Uh, I think the AI-enabled nuclear torpedo is the, the stuff of nightmares. Human is a human out of the loop decision making. So that's like uh, Terminator, uh, Terminator Two, right? Uh, and I, there was a there was a quote you said that I thought was just excellent. Was it government will never be able to outregulate innovation? Is that you said. Okay. I love that one. Thank you. I'll steal that. Okay. For our next uh, panelist, we have uh, uh, Dr. Ji Young Yu. Uh, again, she's the associate research fellow the Science and Technology Policy Institute in Korea. Uh, her research interest mainly lies in the regulatory governance of trade, technology, and security, and she has been regularly working with uh, MOTI and the Ministry of Science and ICT in Korea. Uh, she currently leads research projects that aim to analyze policy implications of U.S.-China strategic competition emergence of technology alliances, and expansion of digital trade agreements. So she's the right person for this presentation. Uh, she received her MIS and PhD in international studies from Seoul National University, and holds a BSc in economic history with economics from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Uh, thank you, Dan, for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ji Yong Yu, um, Associate Research Fellow at Science and Technology Policy Institute, which is one of the national policy think tanks in the Republic of Korea. Um, I appreciate the invitation to this 10th uh, anniversary seminar on strategic trade management, and also the support from Ministry of Trade, Industry, and Energy, and Korean Security Agency of Trade and Industry. Um, as we have been talking about for quite a while today, um, in, even in the previous sessions, I think we can start with the issue of the definition. Um, and the term emerging technology itself um, does not seem to have a worldwide standing definition. And it, in fact, it is actually very hard to define in the first place. Um, but if I can assume for it to refer to a group of 
cutting edge um, disruptive technologies that are newly developed or recently available for new applications. Um, it is true that they inherently tend to carry dual use characteristics. And I think that is why we um, already have a common understanding that there could be a room for policy intervention to mitigate certain risks and threats um, of malicious use of these technology in the advantage of policy void. Um, but then the question is, um, how can we identify specific security challenges that these technologies pose? And at the same time, how can we design these controls to prevent, for example, WMD end use, but at the same time does not necessarily halt um, acquisition, transfer, or development of these new advanced technology for general and commercial purposes? So what I would be talking about briefly in this presentation is a quick overview of the regulatory environment in Korea on a selected group of technology as I am the only delegate from Korea. And personally, as a researcher, I would like to spend a bit more time on pointing out a list of challenges we face in establishing these control regimes for emerging technologies. Um, so, uh, from the basic information, um, in Korea we do maintain an export licensing system in accordance to the four international arrangements for non-proliferation. And depending on the types of items, there are three major agencies respons responsible for the issuance of license. But especially for strategic items of dual use, Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy is in control of them based on a number of uh, relevant acts in Korea. Korea also operates catch-all controls by looking into end use, final destination, expertise gap, deviation from any ordinary transaction, and etc. for items not listed as strategic items. And this review process has been usually invoked to comply with UN sanctions or recently against Russia on non-strategic items. Um, but otherwise, in record, Korea has been rather cautious on issuing unilateral denial, denial of exports on non-strategic items. If Korea aims to um, apply licensing controls on emerging technology that are not yet listed as strategic items, um, which means those outside the boundary of recent updates in the Bosnia arrangement or Australia group and so on, um, there is a possibility to manage them under this um, situational permission review process that we call it domestically. Um, but Korea currently does not maintain any further um, unilateral control on specific emerging technology for non proliferation purposes. Um, aside from the export licensing system, we do have several legal bases to protect technology. Um, most of them may refer to the critical technologies that we have already covered in the previous session. And this regulatory system is motivated mainly to manage leakage or um, takeover of nationally invested development of technology. And they are not just recent developments, um, but more and more attention is put on these systems as well. And especially due to heightened geopolitical tensions, and recently technology management for economic and industrial competitiveness seems to converge into national security reasons in many different countries as well. So the list in this slide are examples of certain technology groups that are under control for protection in Korea. And we have several categories such as national core technology, um, strategic technology, and critical strategic technology to name a few. Um, the most concrete list for current technology protection regime in Korea is the National Core Technology, which consists of 12 technology groups, including semiconductors, display, electronics, ICT, biotechnology, and etc. And this list contains a range of technology where Korea considers to have some competitiveness and therefore do cover some of the more advanced, um, technologically advanced items. Also, a group called Strategic Technology is to be selected under the recent act that has been passed in Korea, and we are yet to know a specific list of it. Um, there can be some overlap between these technology groups, so in the future, this protection system could be um, amended or combined. But anyhow, these groups of industrial technology are maintained to require review and monitoring from the government in case of exports or mergers with foreign entities. And lastly, a group called Critical Strategic Technology that has been announced at the, last, uh, at the end of last year contains about 10 technology groups um, 
and certain technologies that are listed in this group can be considered as emerging technology. For example, it includes AI, space technology, and quantum computing. Um, but any specific action is unexpected in the near future, since this list domestically lacks the legal basis for now. So overall, um, Korea shares the concern for expert controls on emerging technology and is following with much of the internationally ongoing discussions for cooperation, but it has been yet reserving um, unilateral action on the subject matter. And given the concerns, I would like to spend the rest of the presentation talking about a number of challenges we face to build a sound export control regime on emerging technology. And I think uh, much of it has been already um, mentioned by our previous speakers, but hopefully I can add slightly onto that discussion. And first, maintaining a list of emerging technology for export controls itself is a tricky job. In certain areas of frontier technology, like in the case of quantum computing, for example, um, just like in the most apparent example, if we go back um, in history, like just like how vacuum tubes used to be the mainstream before semiconductors actually uh, to overtook the lead towards ICT revolution, this kind of unpredictability is also one big hurdle in applying these controls. And at the same time, once it happens, the rapid pace of development and innovation in new technology can also mean that the list should be updated Accordingly, otherwise the controls can soon become obsolete. Also, um, identifying the method and boundary of control for a certain technology could be challenging. Defining the composition of technology itself is not always clear-cut um, according to the traditional classification of goods and knowledges um, exchanged in tangi tangible or intangible format. As you all know, in the case of AI, um, there can be data sets, um, source codes, algorithms, AI software, or specific AI chips that run the application, and also the AI applied final goods, such as intelligent robots or autonomous vehicles, um, they can all be in part of the whole AI technology value chain. Um, instead of a supply chain approach, um, in terms of technical hierarchy, we can also distinguish AI into infrastructure, um, technological enablers, and application layers, for example and maybe try to figure out a specific choke point for controls if it is, uh, only if it is possible. And at the same time, given the nature of how comprehensive AI is developed, um, along with the controls and specific items, any possible me methods to monitor from the development stage of technology could be a subject of regulatory concern as well. Um, there is also a challenge that the objective of designing these expert controls on emerging technology is getting much more multifaceted, but also sometimes obscure. Um, I find more and more discussions these days tend to spill over to broader national security concerns than on clear analysis of military or human rights threats to support the argument for expert controls. Yet it requires caution in utilizing the concept of national security since it is a subjective one and it often can work as a magic word that can disrupt any constructive debate on how and why. If we focus too much on the innovation gap between individual countries for competitiveness um, as national security, there is also a high risk of counterproductive impact in the long run. Um, the race in R&D spending on certain industries, along with stringent unilateral export controls, may only further distort markets. Um, in other words, the like-minded countries should establish a well-clarified set of values and standards of security risks that support cooperation for sound technology management. We should also make sure such competitiveness race does not aggravate global in um, technological inequality between the North and the South. Meanwhile, the effectiveness of export controls for strategic competition can be rather elusive in reality. Especially in the case of AI, even though it is often classified as one of the emerging technologies, the literature has been spanning for decades to the, open to the public, and commercial trials and applications have been mostly based on open source. Therefore, promoting export controls on mature technology would not generate, um, guarantee successful results. So rather, the imperative for the regulatory authorities would be, again, to develop a clear framework 
um, to define and evaluate security risks of AI technology and strengthen the ability to pick and choose a narrow, specifically targeted AI control. Um, given all these challenges ahead, in observation, there tends to be more diverse types of measures, such as those efforts to enhance supply chain security in the private sector, for example, that emerge and supplement to stringent export controls. So what we can emphasize for now is industry participation and support as a precondition for a successful and well-balanced control regime on emerging technology. In order to avoid excessive controls, um, it is important for the private sector to understand the importance of maintaining resilient supply chain security, and capacity building efforts on cybersecurity should need more emphasis as well. Abiding by the technical and ethical principles and standards from the development stage, um, especially in the case of AI, for example, would help avoid unintentional human rights violation through breach of privacy or deepfake applications that can often happen in non-military contexts as well. Um, effective public-private partnership is essential in shaping the regulatory discourse, and this can happen only when there is a number of eligible players in the ecosystem. Also, in the longer term, it would be possible for the like-minded countries to have a similar level of interest and commitment for any potential control regime when each of these nations have certain level of fair domestic ecosystem regarding those specific technology. So I think there should be much more emphasis in the role of the private sector in general as a foundation to any regulatory development in the future. Um, what I have listed out in this presentation provides more questions than solutions for now, um, but hopefully through this kind of outreach event today, more fruitful discussions are facilitated among both the internal and international multi-stakeholders in the scene. I'll stop here, thank you. Presentation. Uh, great example of how Korea regulates emerging technology. Uh, a great model for other countries in the region to consider, kind of address the challenges that you're facing. Uh, there's going to be a regulatory session uh, after this panel, uh, after the coffee break, where some of the regulators will uh, read out for everybody. Um, so I encourage you to go talk to uh, our Korean colleagues about their experience. Uh, you also you know, talked about the role of industry. And I'm hope, hoping we can bring that into the discussion quite a bit. So those of you out there, if you have questions or comments about the role that industry can play, uh, please let us know. I think that will be a very fruitful discussion. Okay, our final uh, panelist is uh, Anita uh, Zinzuvadia. Uh, she's a licensing officer and senior engineer with the Bureau of Industry and Security, or BIS, uh, within the Office of National Security and Technology Transfer Controls. Her focus areas include computers, telecommunications, and information security export controls. Uh, she also covers emerging technology areas of quantum computing, artificial intelligence, surveillance, and cybersecurity for BIS. Uh, she is the designated federal officer for the Information Systems Technical Advisory Committee and participates as part of the U.S. delegation at Bosnia Arrangement Expert Group Meetings in Vienna, Austria. Anita is a graduate of North Carolina State University with a BS in Electrical Engineering. Please, Anita. Thank you. Hello. I have about 15, ex 15 years of experience at BIS as a licensing officer and a engineer. So I've been on the front lines, working in the weeds, I'd say, of encryption, uh, information security, uh, computing, and sometimes electronics. In emerging technology terms, we can call this cyber, quantum, uh, artificial intelligence. And if anyone wants to add more to our plate in our division, um, someone see me about producing a digital twin. So like I said, um, emerging technology has taken up more and more of our bandwidth. And I hope in the next few slides to convey um, some of the perspectives from the working level within BIS. 
The Bureau of Industry and Security, as the name implies, sits at the intersection of dual-use technology and security purposes, not just security purposes. In emerging technology, it is not our goal to place export controls and restrictions on, and regulations on all emerging technologies. Rather, it's our duty, our responsibility, to understand and identify these technologies that are the most, that pose the most risk for national security and foreign policy objectives. This intersection is getting quite busy, and I see this firsthand. Uh, when I started at the Bureau in 2007, the main topic was encryption, um, and that evolved then into what some of you may remember as big data. Big data evolved into what we know today more of as an artificial intelligence machine learning. Also, encryption itself evolved more into cybersecurity. In 2018, the Export Control Reform Act was passed and it laid out an emerging technology process for us to follow. Arguably, we've been doing this all along, that is, reviewing the Commerce Control List and Control List to understand what new controls should be placed on it. But Section 1758, as we call it, codified this process um, into addressing emerging and foundational technologies. And more recently, we've moved to the terminology to call emerging and foundational technology controls as Section 1758 controls. If you ever see that published as part of Commerce Rules, this is an indication that it is coming from the emerging and foundational technology process. Um, and in our experience, within the interagency experience uh, uh, at BIS and, and working with our colleagues, at other agencies, we realized that it was not it was not always easy to readily categorize uh, technologies as emerging or foundational, and so this was the reason we moved to to calling them Section 1758 controls. For example, as as we've already uh, discussed, um, the principles of AI were established 50 years ago. It's not until the tipping point around 2011 when Moore's Law allowed for the compute to take off and for artificial intelligence and machine learning to take advantage of the hardware capability. We observed that same concept in other technologies as well. So rather than distinguishing foundational and emerging technologies, uh, BIS believes that the U.S the U.S.'s government uh, resources and our mandate from the U.S. Congress are better served to identify technologies that are essential uh, for U.S. national security under Section 1758 rules. So the bottom line here is that we are responsive to national security threats posed by new technologies and innovations of old technologies, whether or not they are formally identified uh, identified, we want to identify the technologies rather than determine whether they're emerging or foundational. Seventeen fifty eight really gives us a process. It gives us a process in identifying and controlling emerging technologies. Interagency process, and it, it's an interagency process that asks us to use our resources both public and classified. On the public portion, this uh, requires our participation in industry forums, groups, and consortiums. This is a balanced approach, approach with industry and government experts. Uh, the Technical Advisory Committee, one that is near and dear to, to me, um, is a hybrid situation in that we can invite industry in to the, to the rulemaking process before rules are published so that we can get their technical Classified information is also part of this process, the, the classified or, or internal process. Um, we, for, in this perspective, we take into consideration intelligence reports, and um, the Committee on Foreign Investments 
in the US, if yes, these reviews can also at times provide an indicator uh, of what may, might be coming down the pike with respect to emerging technologies. In developing control, we consider a few things. Foreign availability, and we do not want to disadvantage US companies if similar performing technologies are available outside the US or a group of allied countries. We want to understand the impact to U.S. industry and to the industry as a whole. We seek to understand the market impact that any of our action that any of our actions may take in order to not harm competitiveness. The effectiveness of export controls and limiting pro proliferations is also important. There are open source or commodity products available. Those might not be the best um, additions to a list-based control. 1758 also asks that we include a notice and comment period so that we can get industry feedback and public feedback. And finally, we seek multilateral uh, cooperation and multilateral approach to our actions. And I'll speak more on this later. So as you can see, this is a delicate balance. Our mandate under ECRA starts with national security, but it also directs us to be very thoughtful about our uh, controls and tailor them carefully. A strong relationship between BIS and the institutions that you all represent is essential. We must get this right, and to do so, that it requires technical understanding, including the benefits and the concerns associated with specific technologies. And it requires acting, again, in a tailored and targeted way to protect national security while supporting uh, the technologies in the commerce, in commerce. This is a collaboration. Again, as DFO of the Information Systems Technology Advisory Committee, this includes in, this allows us to include many companies in, in, maybe some in this room, to be able to talk directly. It allows me to be able to talk directly to the experts in the field of technology and business and the commerce of those technologies. This is an instrument uh, that allows us uh, on a day-to-day -day basis when reviewing emerging technologies to get real-time feedback. So some of this collaboration comes from industries like you. It also comes from academic institutions, um, where some of the newest research is being spun off into startups. It's also a collaboration with our own government technical experts. For example, DOE experts, Department of Energy experts, who may be implementing high-performance computing, or our colleagues within the Department of Commerce who are implementing standards in post-quantum cryptography. The need for a network is certainly strong. And it's a shared responsibility. We cannot do this alone, and nor do we seek to do it alone. Export controls are most effective when applied on a multilateral basis with like-minded partners. And this can take place in many ways. The US belongs to several multilateral agreements. And the shared responsibility can also take place in bilateral, multilateral um, agreements between supplier states, for example. Cooperation among like-minded states ensures maximum security protection against malign actors from assessing, accessing sensitive items and technology. It also ensures members within the, agree the agreement a level playing field on the global market. This is just a list of several multilateral regimes that the U.S. belongs to. I won't spend too much time on this. And here I'll go through some more recent controls that we've issued. Um, as recently as August 15th, the BIS uh, published 1758 rules on a few emerging technologies. 
First of uh, being uh, new controls on two substrates, gallium oxide and diamonds for ultra-band gap semiconductors. We also uh, uh, published a new control in 3D006 for software for electronic computer, computer aided design software for the development of gate all around uh, of FET circles, of uh, uh, circuits, rather. We also published um, uh, pressure gain combustion technology, uh, which has extensive potential uh, for terrestrial and aerospace applications, including rockets and hypersonics. And we didn't stop there. Uh, past actions that the IS has taken um, are reflected on this side, uh, this slide, uh, in hybrid additive manufacturing, um, and a couple of these in category five, which are, which I personally put in some man hours. Uh, person hours, uh, forensics, and softwares for monitoring uh, and analysis of communications, and category nine for some orbital uh, craft. And again, there's and there's more. We added um, 24 chemical precursors to the list. There are also controls on single-use biological cultivation chambers and software design for nucleic acid assemblers and synthesizers. So we've been quite busy. So the next two slides, I'll just use this as a whole thing. So the next two slides, all I'm going to concentrate on artificial intelligence and quantum. How we've been thinking about this within the IS. And in particular, we determined a few pillars. Uh, the, the first three uh, is AI compute hardware, AI algorithms, and data for training AI models. And from our study, um, some of the most apt uh, controls could go towards AI compute hardware. These are, for example, high-end GPUs, accelerators, ASICs, FPGAs. These are enablers of machine learning because of their capacity for parallel processing. They're also building blocks for supercomputers and high-performance computers. Um, also, that could be um, a target for export controls is understanding where and how manufacturing equipment and software plays a role in developing these chips. Less apt for export controls are the open source AI algorithms and data itself. It's hard to control the data itself on using an export control. In some instances, some of the data can be controlled already if it's classified. Um, that already has some protections on it. Also application-specific artificial intelligence. We do have one unilateral control for geospatial learning software under our 521, uh, 0D521 ECCN uh, classification. And we also have existing ITAR controls as there's military-specific uh, and military in intelligence-specific controls um, that are governed by a separate set of regulations. We also have human rights end use controls, that is uh, naming certain end users uh, who use AI-enabled surveillance tools. That's also an option that we have, have taken. And then quantum. I'll close here in saying that quantum has a longer runway um, before quantum can actually break cryptography. Um, although we do see some near-term uses of what they call NIST-Q or um, noisy intermediate scale quantum, which are pretty interesting. We are, we are also studying post-quantum cryptography and added regulations to this in Category 5 Part 2 three or four years ago. We are studying existing regulations, um, meaning to say there are existing regulations that address some quantum Choke point technologies is another place that we are studying. Choke point technologies such as refrigeration are vital in developing quantum computing. And what we've learned is that quantum computing is a very multidisciplinary art. Um, it requires not just quantum physicists, um, it requires electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, and, and um, the sort to build these large systems. And we respect that it is an area of great research and development. I will end there. 
And uh, I look forward to answering your questions and having more discussion. Thank you. Great job. Thank you, Ania. Thanks for sharing your, a piece of at least of your 15 years of experience on these uh, hot topics. Um, thank you for the nice overview of Section 1758 of the ECRA. Uh, at one point, you mentioned uh, you think about the industry impact of the controls you developed. And obviously, we have an industry audience here. And the first question I see that's come in uh, to Menti is actually uh, an industry-related question about what can industry do. Uh, Stacy, can we actually have the Menti slide up there again? Because people might not still have that code. Maybe we can put the Menti slide with the code and information up so people can submit questions. Uh, but I'll start here with an industry question. Uh, any of you can answer this question. Uh, so how do we, I guess the question is, and it relates to the question that came in, is how do we best calibrate uh, controls so they do not unduly harm industry with these emerging uh, technology areas? Does anybody want to start? I'll, I'll start off. And it's more of a process um, response Working within uh, BIS and working with industries such as yours um, and many that are represented in this room, one critical step that we take in understanding the impact of potential regulations is not just to understand the uh, licensing impact, um, it's also to understand what it means within the industry as a whole within the U.S. or uh, more broadly worldwide. Who are the players and what is the technology? Where could we most target any potential actions? Um, I always uh, personally like to say, where can I have the most bang <laughs> for the buck? Um, so in understanding how potential controls can affect industry, it is my role within BIS to seek that input from industry members and from um, groups that are helping to share information with us um, and helping to enlighten BIS and our interagency colleagues about the technologies that we seek to control. I learn a lot from all of you. And that has certainly uh, become clear when it comes to emerging technologies. Um, as we've said, we don't want to over-control, and innovation comes from you all. And, uh, I, and I'm constantly a student of, of, all of all of this and from industry. Um, and I think that's uh, a, way, a way that we, we think about it uh, at BIS, at least in my Well, I think I can just add on a little bit. I'm pretty much um, agreeing with what Anita actually said. Um, I think the technology itself, um, the industry and the researchers actually know the best what they're doing. They design from the first how to develop, where to go, and how to use it in the end. So I think definitely collaboration um, between the private or the academia with the public is a key thing for us to design these controls as well. Um, and pretty much having lots of communication um, for the public. I think it's the role for the public sector to actually um, convene these kind of meetings more often and then try to listen more from the industry. So that, I think that is how we can start. Thank you. Uh, so actually, Stacy, I lost the ability to see the questions now that the audience are sending. They were pouring in. So, but we can come back once I can see him again. Uh, but I think there was some questions in there related to uh, how can industry kind of best contribute uh, to the rulemaking process, or can industry contribute during that process? I don't know if Kit, if you have any thoughts about that or others. Sure. Um, my the the best I've seen uh, collaboration work between the private sector, academia, and government really is when uh, these conversations happen early. And in the United States, there's an increasing focus on guardrails for emerging technologies. 
And so what that means in the U.S. context is if you are uh, an, an academic institute or if you're a private company and you receive certain money from the U.S. government to conduct research for chip manufacturing or other emerging technologies like quantum and AI, uh, you are required to work with the U.S. government to ensure that technology is controlled from the point of the research starting. Um, so that's what, in the U.S. context anyway, is referred to as the control life cycle. And so there's a huge policy debate, um, certainly in Congress and other kind of legislative bodies around the world on the role of this, but um, when it comes to cooperation and when it comes to rulemaking, um, ensuring that industry provides input to regulators before a technology is controlled is certainly easier for innovation um, in the long term, you know, business development aspects associated with that, that particular technology. Because the last thing that anybody in industry wants to do is self-fund uh, a technology or a new piece of research with the hopes of commercializing that, and then the U.S. government or other governments um, saying thanks, but no thanks, we're going to take that and we're going to control that. Sorry. So it's way easier to get in front of that earlier than it is later in that process. Thank you, Kip. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions pouring in for you, Anita, sorry to say. Uh, interesting question here. So, when developing these Section 1758 controls, how does BIS separate the geopolitical considerations from the technical considerations? Well, I can answer that from the technical perspective. I'm here as a engineer and a licensing officer from BIS. So, my role in distinguishing these technologies is at the technical level. Um, I'll, uh, I, I will let um, you know, others at PIS speak to some of the more geopolitical um, aspects of it. But for me, um, answering that question is at my level, I, it's my duty to understand uh, the technology at, at a technical level um, and to feed that into a, the bigger process, right? So um, being part, that's a vital part that I, that my role is within the bigger picture. Um, and I advocate for that part. I understand, I try to understand industries um, and where they're coming from. And I, in a way, advocate for making sure that we take technical consideration into, um, into any of the thoughts that we have that work its way more up into the geopolitical situations and, and those perspectives. But I appreciate the question. Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll direct a question here that isn't just to you, but can be addressed by uh, others as well. There's a question here about uh, catch-all controls, and, and can catch-all controls you know, help to initially capture potential illicit use of an emerging technology, and how is that done? What is, what is the role of catch-all controls here? I guess we've heard about it a bit today, but maybe we can elaborate that on that as well. Um, okay, maybe I can start. Um... Well, before we actually have a list of um, specific emerging technologies or whatever we could call it, um, this kind of expert control list, um, basically as what other speakers have already talked about, how this technology is going to be used is the main point of the regulation. So um, basically the method that we have for casual controls looking into end use, um, final destination, who is going to use this technology, where it is headed to, how it's going to apply, um, these kind of um, criteria that we already have could actually initially serve as a role to catch certain ma malicious use of certain technologies. And I think before we actually come up with a specific um, expert control list for emerging technology, this kind of method, um, of course we should be cautious and expanding too much, but still this kind of method can serve as a preliminary start where, can, where we can regulate them. Thank you. And, and I would just briefly add, and this goes back to the earlier question about geopolitical risks. Um, as a former government official, I'm a, a little bit more liberty to discuss this, I guess, but it, the U.S. government over the last um, you know, 12 months really has utilized new authorities and new and creative ways to target high-risk jurisdictions uh, Russia being one of them. But this is relevant from the perspective of catch-all controls because one of the 
emerging trends uh, with regulators in the United States is this so-called uh, presumption of or the rebuttable presumption. Uh, for those that may not know this, it was originally enacted in June of this year in the United States as it relates to forced labor um, in China. And the law basically states that um, you cannot import anything into the United States from Xinjiang because it's assumed to have used forced labor in its manufacture, therefore that product is banned uh, from importation. Uh, there's debate within the policy uh, community in Washington, D.C. that instead of relying on catch-all controls, which has you know, historically been the, the bedrock for export controls, uh, what would happen if there was uh, a blanket denial on uh, exports to a certain jurisdiction or a certain uh, sector of a jurisdiction, similar to how sectoral sanctions have taken place uh, against Russia over the last few years. So I just state that there is an emerging trend in the United States that catch-all controls could be augmented by uh, overall presumption of denials against entire swaths of a particular economy. Thank you, Kip. Uh, a lot of questions, actually several, coming in about uh, the entity list. Uh, so specifically, how does a sanctioned en entity get itself removed from, you know, could be the BIS entity list or any entity list? What is the process for getting removed from, from the list? Um, yeah, that might be a better question for some of my colleagues who um, administer the entity list. But I do believe there is an appeal process, and I, uh, I'd rather not comment on the exact specifics because I don't know them specifically um, to, to be able to run them off to you. But um, there is an appeal process, from what I understand, um, in which you have to show certain aspects of, uh, of an internal so I, I will leave it at that. Thank you. Maybe maybe that's a question that could be directed uh, to our BIS colleagues after the after the break as well. Okay. I have another uh, interesting question here. So how do we deal with fundamental research for emerging tech when you have a suspicious entity involved, but the technology is currently outside of export control? We're talking about fundamental research, basic research. Um, I can chime in briefly. The, when you have universities or you have uh, a company that's funding basic research, uh, there's still risk associated with where that research could end up. Uh, it may not meet the threshold for export controls, uh, but nevertheless, if you've got a foreign uh, military affiliated researcher uh, coming and working with your university or with your company, um, understanding and conducting that enhanced due diligence on that researcher, whether it's a visiting scholar or perhaps it's a research cooperation agreement that you have with a foreign uh, university, trying to ascertain and develop whether or not that person or that entity maintains any ties to a foreign military and user is the first and most important step that you can take to mitigate that type of risk. Um, importantly, for those in the audience that are receiving funding from the U.S. Department of Defense, whom I know um, some of you are, there are certain guidelines and restrictions uh, with respect to you uh, taking on uh, Department of Defense funds to conduct that research or that prototyping or that manufacturing and enabling certain foreign nationals from high-risk jurisdictions to have access to that information, whether it's classified or controlled or not. Um, there are blanket restrictions on some of that activity, and I would encourage everyone to ensure that you're aware of those. Um, I don't know if others have additional comments. So we still have another seven and a half minutes here, so we have quite a few questions coming in. Um, we have a question that's kind of related to intangible technology transfer. So the question is, uh, sorry. So how do we uh, control sending of um, information, so intangible technology, emerging technology, uh, via email address between two parties? Like, it's kind of a broad question, but I guess maybe that's question for the role of industry, how, how do we control that kind of exchange of information via email? Controlled data technology is what's subject to some of the to U.S. controls. So in, in order to answer that question, you would have to know what is in the email with respect to is it controlled technology? Are you conveying that information? Um, and where is it going, going to? You know, we provided some guidance um, with respect to uh, well, uh, cloud computing, for example, and storing uh, information in the cloud. 
Um, and some of our regulations refer to end-to-end -end encryption, um, using encryption to maintain the security, the security boundaries of that data while it is traveling through the cloud um, and from one, one place to another. Um, and that it is only meant to be encrypted by the destination. And within the U.S., we have some standards that we apply. Um, FIPS 182, for example, is a standard in which we use uh, to, to determine the security of, of this end-to-end -end encryption, um, as long as it uh, abides by that, those standards. Um, so um, that is one way in our regulations recognize the, the export of technical data, like email, or whether it's on the cloud. Um, and, and so, you know, those are some steps you can take to maintain the security of that data as it is in transit um, to be uh, when you're using cloud services um, and, and if anyone else has a perspective on it. Thank you, Anita. Uh, so we have another question here, and I'm going to kind of modify this question a little bit. Uh, the question is about Emerging Tech and how it's constantly evolving. Uh, the question is, how do we make sure that regulatory controls are up to date? So really it's a question, uh, how are emerging technologies kind of challenging the traditional approach to export controls? Uh, and I'd also ask, can the current multilateral export control regimes effectively address uh, controls for emerging technology? If anybody wants to try to tackle that one. Right, I'll try. Um, the, I'll reverse chronological order here. The multilateral regimes that are in place uh, are decades old and rely on a complicated and slow process to gain consensus. Um, that's diplomacy at work and it will always be like that, but emerging technology will uh, not surprisingly move a lot faster. So there are new uh, secure supply chain policies and regulations that are coming into place. Uh, we've started to see this in the United States with the European Union, developing um, technology working groups, um, trying to understand what FASTNAR 2.0 could look like. I'm sure our colleagues at BIS could probably answer that in more detail. But the idea is the list-based control approach that uh, the NSG, the AG, other groups have utilized over the last few decades uh, may not be the most efficient way to control technology from an export perspective, but more importantly, I think as we have all learned during COVID, uh, secure supply chains uh, go both ways. And the policymakers in DC and Europe, and certainly uh, with the Quad here in APAC, recognize and appreciate that and are uh, investing in those secure supply chains to ensure that not just uh, technologies are controlled from an export perspective, but uh, there's more foundational and emerging technology research and development, prototyping and manufacturing that happens in a secure environment at large. Um, I think there's another part of that question that I forgot. <laughs> uh, I think you answered it pretty comprehensively. I won't make you do any more. Uh, let me, oh, go ahead, Doctor. Yes, um, I could just add a little bit. I do agree with the problem with the consensus and those kind of decision-making process that we have in the international um, arrangements um, setting. Um, and I think that is also why um, there are some movements or plurilateral or bilateral movements to come up with um, cooperation for these controls. Um, but then, um, look, um, taking in the perspective of a supply chain kind of approach, it could be a little hard, especially for emerging technologies, because for example, like semiconductors, it has a manufacturing base, it's easier for us to identify the supply chain itself or the suppliers and so on to make this kind of thing work. However, in terms of even just for AI, for example, it's a, it's a, it itself, the technology itself is important, but then we also talked about how it can be applied with other technologies as well. It is very hard to identify who are the major suppliers, what is the choke point there, how we want to control this. So even though we try these kind of new um, ways to come up with cooperation, I think um, that is why we're still um, contemplating much on how to devise this. Thank you. We have time for one last question. I know we've asked a lot of this panel, uh, a lot of questions. Uh, let's end with kind of a fun one. Um, question is related to uh, Starlink and Tesla, and the person is asking, how is this technology regulated today, and how will the technology used in Starlink and in Tesla autonomous vehicles be regulated in the future? 
or will it be regulated? Um, so autonomous driving is an interest, interesting uh, one. I think it's also enabled by um, computer compute hardware com chips. Um, and and it re again, it remains, it's a, it's a study point to make sure that we are drawing the line um, not in, in a way that's pre precise and targeted towards things that uh, in the U.S., our objective is to target things that have uh, target our controls uh, from a national security perspective, and that is in our, our mission. Um, and in doing so, um, you know, not all autonomous driving presents such threats. Um, and so, those are the kinds of things we, we would look at, at, at with respect to autonomous driving and how it can have more of a where to draw that line with respect to military application and dual use applications. Um, and, you know, One last thing um, is the evolution of regulations to include personal, uh, personal identifiable information, PII, as it's referred to in the United States, where you have, if you're driving a Tesla, all of that data about where you are, when you were there, those vehicles that are around you, um, who's with you in the vehicle. All of that information provides data about you. It provides data about the activities that you conduct. And in the United States, there are now controls. Um, if you have, I believe it's over a million U.S. citizens worth of data like that in one uh, central data repository, there are regulations and authorities that dictate who can access that data, where can that data be accessed from. And a lot of that is dictated through, of all places, um, CFIUS. So the Committee for Foreign Investment in the United States has control over that US personal identifiable information. And other countries, as uh, Tesla and Starlink, uh, continue to acquire more data about citizens' activity in that particular region, in that jurisdiction, uh, that creates uh, security risks. So it's not export controls, per se, but it's about having all of your citizens' data in one central repository, and what do you do to ensure privacy standards are adequately protected? Um, also, it'd be really cool to have a Tesla and have one, but we need to have one. Okay. That's a good one to end up. So, I'd like to thank our panel so much. Uh, great expertise that they've shown us here. They've worked really hard to answer so many questions, so really appreciate the time. Uh, I'd like to give them a round of applause. turn it over to Seema for her final uh, remarks for the first day of the GAO. Thank you. That was an excellent panel. And I think one of the reasons why we, would, we were able to bombard them with questions was, of course, they were knowledgeable and willing to speak, but also that they kept their presentation shorter so we had more time to discuss. So that is something that I would like to point out for all of you who are going to tomorrow. Um, the interactions are so much more fun when we do have a relaxed, you know, enough time to have a relaxed Q&A session, which is the whole point of these in-person meetings. So, um, with that. Uh, tomorrow we begin again, same time, right here. We will have another, you know, great set of presenters. We will be focusing a lot more on enforcement tomorrow. So, I hope all of you who have had questions about enforcement of different, whether it's sanctions or export controls, uh, will come with your questions about that. Uh, not personal gripes, but general systemic questions, I hope. <laughs> we'll do that. And uh, with that, we will end this session today. And uh, the regulators are going to be here, um, or the speakers are going to be here in the first set of tables. So you can come and spend time and ask all those questions that you were sending us, but you were not able to send them to the speakers. Uh, you have a chance to get them. Yeah, so yeah, so we will break now and then when you come back before 15, they will all be here. Thank you very much.